So tell us about yourself, brother. You know, I grew up, um, you know, wrestling and playing a lot of sports. I got into the punk rock and skinhead scene. I ended up being in a band called The Escaped, and we traveled for about five years, played all over the country. We played like CBGBs and Gilman Street and some more tours. So I did a lot with that. And then um, from that, I got into motorcycles and started riding a ton, um, you know, hung out with some clubs in, in Oregon. And then I moved to Nevada and ended up uh, linking up with the Vagos. And I was with them for just under two years. Um, and then I ended up joining the Mongols and I ended up being in the Mongols for just shy of 15 years. I left about a year ago. You say back in the skinhead scene, but it wasn't like there's, there's different types of skinheads, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for people that don't know that, you know, traditional skinhead scene was, um, almost equivalent to like the punk rock scene and the fact that it was just about music and fashion. Um, it, it you know, that came up in, in the sixties, especially, you know, England, Jamaica, um, big West Indian influence from Jamaica, but main, mainly in England. And then, you know, in, in the 80s, it got really publicized and, you know, the media took over it and it really got affiliated with the right wing and politics. But but the early form of that traditional version um, is just a movement of, you know, music and, and fashion. And so, you know, there's a big, big uh, culture of, of traditional skinheads that aren't really political. Um, and then, you know, the side we were on was it, we ended up I mean, we were anti-racist because we fought with a lot of the neo -Nazi skinheads, but they weren't necessarily even in the same it's like same subculture as us, man. These guys were, were sp strictly in it for politics. They're in it, you know, to, to you know, push their beliefs where we were going to concerts and, and definitely into the music and the scene. So it was right. more just to keep them out of our scene than anything that, you know, when it first started anyways. Right. And and that's what people don't understand. It's a lot of it is it's about the music. They don't understand. They just hear this uh, this movement and they think negative right away. When right. And it's very similar to biker culture too, right? Like the media gets a hold of it and they do their spin and then the, the public believes what they believe off of what they heard from the media. Um, and just like, you know, how one percenters and bikers are all these bad dudes and do all this illegal stuff and maf mafia on wheels and all the stuff that the media says, um, you know, same thing happened with skinheads. So there's a really strong parallel between the two, um, you know, depending on how they were portrayed in the media and then how the public kind of ate it up. So uh, what area of the country was this all in growing up? I grew up in Salem, Oregon, just outside of Portland. And then after high school, I moved to Portland. Um, okay. So I spent most of the time there. I did live, like, so like I said, I moved to Carson City um, for a while. And then I also, when I was a Mongol, I lived in San Diego for a while. And then I did my undergrad at Whittier College. So I lived in, in Whittier, East of Los Angeles for a while as well. LA is a different scene. I lived out there for about two years and uh, I worked in Azusa. I ran a bar called Callahan's out there. It was basically a biker bar and the Vagos would show up and the Mongols would show up sometimes, you know? Yep. Yeah, that area for sure. They're two completely different types of groups. The Vagos, a little more rowdy, a little more, uh, they were out there to party, you know, as to where the Mongols, they were there to enjoy themselves. At what age did you join the Vagos? Uh, I was about 25 when I first started hanging around clubs. And, and yeah, I was, I was about 25 when I joined the Vagos because I joined the Mongols at 27. Okay. How did that go? How did it go? You leave one club. You, bet, you go over to another club. Uh, was there any fallout for that? Was there any animosity? Yeah, definitely. There was quite a bit. I think, you know, from some of these shows I've been doing and reading some of the comments and stuff, I think a lot of people from outside of our culture or our scene don't understand how relatively common it, it is, you know, for guys to patch over. Um, I know the Vagos are a much bigger club now and they wear a 1% or diamond now and stuff. But at, this was 2005. Um, they were definitely on the come up. They were growing and I'm not saying they weren't like big or well-respected or anything like that. They just weren't, you know, on a national scale that they are now. And within the 15 years I spent in the, in the Mongols, I'd say at least two dozen, if not more Vagos had patched over over the years. So although not like super common, it wasn't crazy either. Um, you know, I came in in a time, it, I probably wouldn't have been able to come in under a little Dave or any of the other leadership. I came in in a time under doc and, and doc, doc was in this like heavy recruiting drive, um, and, you know, I, I hate to say it because it's not a good look, but, you know, it's essentially taking most people. Um, and so, you know, I, I came in under that. Usually th for years, the Mongols and Vagos have an agreement where they won't take each other's members. I'm sure they probably still do. Um, there's just been certain windows and certain doors from time to time where it's either negotiated or it's not. Um, when I came in, it was not negotiated and um, it didn't go smooth. Um, I'm, I'm great with that. You know, I'm cool with that club now and I have friends in it, but it, it wasn't a smooth transition when I did it too. Um, you know, there was, there was a handful of us in Oregon that did it together. And there was a couple of us in Carson and, and, and Vegas that did it as well. And then eventually the whole chapter from Redding, California too. So it wasn't just like one or two of us going, there was 
you know, close to a dozen of us. So mm-hmm. you can imagine, you know, how the Vogue was felt about that. It, you know, it was, it was obviously, it wasn't meant as disrespect, but it was definitely a disrespectful move. And that's how it went. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, is, you know, you joined the club over the years, you either see things that just, you know, just rub you the wrong way, or it's just not for you, but you still, the club life's for you. Just the club wasn't. Yeah, no, definitely. So, you know, when I started coming around clubs, I didn't know anything about clubs, man. So when I was hanging out with this, I, I hung out with an old school club called The Outsiders in Portland initially. Um, and, they're, you know, very cool, very well respected old school club. And they taught me a lot about like club tradition and protocol and all the stuff that was well above my head from the skinhead world, you know. Um, but, you know, that was one of those things where I noticed that the only thing I really had in common with these guys was motorcycles. Like we weren't from the same generation. Culturally, things were super different. And so I really got swept up in the Vagos because when I was in Nevada, I met a lot of Vagos that were like skateboarders and into punk rock. And, um, you know, it was, it was just, you know, more clean cut and didn't have the long hair. And, you know, you know it was just a way different culture. And, um, you know, being an impulsive young kid, I just I jumped in without really hanging around long enough to see the politics and what the club was really all about. Um, So when I did move, you know, like you were saying, I I think, you know, if you're really into that lifestyle or that culture, there's a home for everybody. Um, And a lot of the times it's regional, right, or geographical, like depending on who the big club is in your in your area or your region. But, you know, with the Mongols, I found my home, you know, so. You know, I hear I hear the club hopper stuff or this and that. But, man, I was with the Mongols for 15 years. So um, did, did I you know, was it a smooth move to leave the Vagos? No, you know, it was pretty disrespectful to them. And I own up to that. But then I found my home and, and the things I learned in the Vagos and with the other clubs is what helped me be a successful member in the Mongols and why I was a long lasting member in the Mongols as well. So can't necessarily, necessarily say I regret it either. So let's talk about time in the Mongols. 15 years, man, that's a long time. I bet you made a lot, a lot of friends over the years. I did, man. I think I've been really blessed with the fact that I've been pretty good at networking. And so I'm really good at like staying in touch with people, meeting people. Um, So, you know, I, you know, as things progressed and I got into national leadership and stuff, you know, I was the one that did a lot of the sit downs with a lot of the other major clubs. I had a lot of friends and a lot of the other clubs. So I was really opening up communication with, with clubs, you know, around the country. Um, and then, like I said, I moved a little bit. So when I moved around, I started some new chapters. So, you know, in Oregon, I started the very first chapter of the Mongols in Oregon, me, my brother and, and some of the other guys. Um, and, and almost every chapter that was started in Oregon or Washington was either started by me and my brother or someone that we brought into the club. Um, then uh, same thing with those Reading Vagos. Well, I brought them with me to Mongols. Um, and so, you know, we ended up starting that Shasta County chapter there. When I lived in California, I helped start the Fullerton chapter. Um, and then I moved out here to the Midwest in 2017 and, and started several chapters of Missouri, Indiana, and Illinois, too. So, um, you, you know, I spent I spent a lot of time in the, in the club staying busy and staying active. And by being out and being active, you meet people, man. And when you meet people, eventually people want to join or if they like what you got going on or the group that they see, um, you know, just attracts the right people. And, and then growth is natural after that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You, you mentioned Vegas. So Vegas always had, well, I can't say always. When I was growing up, the Vagos were there. The Mongols were obviously in Henderson. But it, the scene wasn't really big for the Vagos or the Mongols. Now, it's basically a Vago town with, with how everything's played out. Yeah, and there's a lot of Mongols there now, too. But you're right. Yeah. When I joined when I joined the Mongols, there was just the Henderson guys there, and there was only a handful of them. Yeah. Um, you know, so that was 2007. Since then, they've, they've grown quite a bit, and they have several chapters there. But even when I was a Vago, you know, the Vagos did a lot of national runs there because their national fee at the time was, was into gambling and went to a lot of casinos and stuff. But it was still um, dominated by, you know, Bandits, Angels, and, and other clubs. Yeah. So, so you joined the Mongols, obviously, after Laughlin, right? Yeah, yeah, I joined in 2007. It's about five years after. So, so what made you leave the Mongols finally after 15 years? Um, you know, there was a few things that played into it. Part of it was just, I, I think this culture is changing, man. The culture is shifting. The, the the a lot of the um, not just the politics, but the type of people that are joining clubs. And I've always ran like a really regimented, strict, structured pro, uh, program, and and I found myself really fighting to do this program that I was used to. And I wasn't, a lot of the membership or the younger membership wasn't necessarily into it. And I was really starting to kind of have this like, you know, deep thought with myself of, am I doing this for me or what's best for the club? Is it what I'm comfortable with because it's what I was taught or, or is it, you know, what's best for the membership? And I really started to feel like the membership didn't really want that, that rigid structure that I used to have. Um, around this time as well, you know, 
around this time as well, politics were getting kind of heavy. There was some other stuff going in that I, that I don't really want to get into, but uh, I'm sure everyone has seen it on the internet and stuff like that. Um, so that was kind of burning me out as well. Um, and then really, man, it just got to the point where, you know, we were, we were kind of going out with another club here. Things were just, I, I don't know. It, it just became where, like I said, I felt like the, the way that I wanted to be a member and the type of member I wanted to be um, was no longer the popular opinion. And, and it was no longer the type of member that the majority of the new membership was. And I, I say that respectfully with the people in there. It's just I was having a hard time grasping the generational change and the leadership change. Um, you know, th those were really, really big parts of it for sure. Well, the leadership change. So you come in under Doc. Right? Yes. At the time, I mean... People say it different ways, but so they're bringing in, you know, a lot of Southsiders, things like that, who don't ride bikes, right? Initially, yeah, man. I mean, that I really would love to tell you that that was myth and rumor. But, you know, one thing that brought me into the motorcycle scene was motorcycles. I love riding motorcycles. And so when I meet new members or new people, one of my first questions is, hey, what kind of bike do you ride? Um, and in that era, I was pretty disappointed when people would, you know, some people would say I don't ride. Um a lot of people still did, but there was definitely members that were joining that didn't. Yeah. And then Doc does what he does. Right. And, and sells the club out, basically. Uh, yeah, 100%. To get right. himself out of his own his own mess that he's yeah. made. How did that go? How did, you know, what was, what was is it like being in the Mongols at the time when, when Doc blew the club up, basically? Yeah, I mean, I came in at the tail end of it, um, you know, so Doc stepped down at like late 07, or early 08, and I or it was probably early 08, and I, I joined in 2007. And so um, early on, you know, my first year in the Mongols uh, was pretty tumultuous. And, and within a few months, you know, I'd been arrested for, um, I was charged with attempted kidnapping for following these federal agents down the road. I didn't know there were federal agents. So I fought that case and I, I and took it to a jury trial and I beat it. But one of the things, I was found guilty of a misdemeanor. And part of that, they put me on non-association probation. So every single time I got caught hanging out at the club, I'd go back for a month or two. And I ended up doing about a year on and off, just going back and forth, back and forth, because I kept being active in the club. So some of that politics stuff, honestly, was missing because I was like, you know, a lot of those runs or meetings, I was either in jail or, or trying to avoid going to jail. So that first year was kind of hit and miss for me. And that's when a lot of that stuff happened. That's when, um, you know, once once I kept getting busted for the non-association, I figured, well, I, I wasn't going to step away from the club. So I moved to San Diego. I figured, you know, that was the best place for me to learn truly, you know, what it was like being a Mongol, learn the old ways, learn the program I wanted to learn. Um, and so I moved to San Diego. And within, I don't know, six months of being in San Diego, Operation Black Rain hit and my whole chapter got decimated. There was two of us left. Um, so I ended up coming back to Oregon, turning myself in, doing a couple more months and then, and then, you know, start kind of started Portland and Salem chapters and some other stuff in Oregon. So that first year, man, it was, it was pretty tough and there was a, so much different stuff going on. It was really hard for me to pay attention to the politics. I was a new member anyways. So a lot of it was above my pay grade and above my head. Um, but there was just so much stuff going on. Right. But finally you had risen through and become, uh, the P of your chapter, right? Yeah, I started out as the, the P of uh, my chapter in, in Oregon. I was a regular member in San Diego. Um, I'd been in a few different positions when I lived in California. And then in 2011, I got brought into the club's mother chapter, which is like our national leadership, um, and developed a, you know, a program called the state rep program where we, we had regional reps for different areas because the club was getting quite a bit bigger and we had to focus on you know what we were going to change as far as leadership goes and how we were going to stay organized. Um, so then I was a regional representative for the whole time I was in the club for different regions, helped oversee out of state. I helped start, um, Australia chapter. Um, I used to see, oversee some of the European chapters and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, I ended up having quite a bit on my plate. The European chapters, uh, for all the clubs, well, that's a wild bunch right there. You know, man, once they kind of, um, put that on my plate, I ended up shutting a lot of it down. The more I looked into them and found out who they were, and a lot of them had bounced around from club to club and not in the way like I was doing. It was more for financial gang and in different purposes. And um, it, it, it really didn't fit what the Mongols were about, or at least at the time what the Mongols were about. Um, you know, they were really spread out. They didn't, they weren't like, a, they couldn't really hold down an area in my opinion. And it ended up being more headache than it was worth. And we ended up shutting down a lot of those chapters. Right. The threat being in a motorcycle club, the threat's always on about getting caught up in a Rico. And I mean, you see it time and time again. You said, OK, the feds were watching you and, and you followed them and, and, you know, had to go back on a violation for whatever they, they had thrown onto your plate. 
but like that's got to be a nervous life too i mean 15 years of you can't even trust half the guys that you're around much less anybody else you know yeah I mean, for sure man it, it's a trip and and I mean, when we sign up for this, we kind of know what we're signing up for. But part of it's, you know, especially as a youngster, we're all pretty naive to a lot of this stuff. And, you know, I, like it, when I first joined a club, I, you know, I, under, I I had read, you know, a lot of books. I knew about Under and Alone and, you know, these ATF agents that infiltrated. But I didn't know a thing about confidential informants and that whole program. And, you know, as it turned out, as, as since Doc grew so quickly, there were so many people in the club that were confidential informants. And, and you know, there was two in Oregon at the time. And I remember these were guys that were doing dope. And we were sending a rehab and trying to get back on their feet. So it was the last thing I ever thought that, you know, they were telling on people. Um, and here they were getting paid, you know, three, four grand a month to be informants. So that was something I was super naive to that that I learned through the years. And, and it definitely makes it, you know, hard to trust people. And, and I don't mean as far as like, oh, we're doing illegal shit. So we, we got to be careful who we talk to. It's just in general, trust in general. And, and I know a lot of those informants that I was around in the early days, they would just make stuff up. They wanted to justify their paychecks. They were... You know, there, I have so many different examples of times that we're making things up. So the trust level is just even like who you're standing near or who you're around in general. Um, yeah, I mean, that gets pretty tiresome. That can definitely burn a person out. So you finally leave. You decide this this isn't for me anymore. I'm, I'm going to step away from the club. How did that go? Initially, it went pretty well. So I left in good standings at first and I was a lot. So if, if you've been in the club for more than 10 years, you're allowed to leave in good standing. So I was retired in good standings. Um, the issues came when uh, a member of the chapter I was in out here in Southern Illinois, he had gotten in a fight uh, with some outlaws and the outlaws press charge, the two members of the hour, that member of the outlaw press charges against him. Um, and so he had to take a plea bargain because this, this outlaw said that, you know, signed a witness statement saying he would take this to trial. And part of his plea, bar plea bargain was non-association probation. So you know, he was going to have to take a step away from the club. He had a two year suspended sentence. So if he got caught violating, you know, he'd go to prison for two years. Well, his blood brother was in the chapter. His roommate was in the chapter. His gun, th this whole chapter I built here in Southern Illinois was very tight knit and very small. So they, everyone kind of took a step down at the same time. And because they didn't have the time and they were put out in bad standing. So, you know, the club had come to me and, and said, Hey, you're in good standings, but just so you know, you know, if you get caught hanging out with these guys, you're going to be out bad. So I was just, very upfront and said, you know, these are, these are some guys I'm really tight with. These are my brothers. And, you know, if that makes me out bad, I guess that's the way it's going to be. And I ended up, you know, I, I took my status on the chin cause it is what it is. Um, but I, I chose to stay loyal to these dudes out here. So, yeah. So have you thought about starting your own like social writers club, not a 1% club, just, uh, something for the motorcycle aspect of it? Yeah, we have a thing. Um, we have a thing going. We call it Lift, Train, Ride, which isn't like the name of a club or anything, but it's just a movement that we put together where, um, you know, all of us, since we all left at the same time, the same group I was talking about, we all decided to stick together. Um, and we follow a lot of the same format that we followed when we were in the motorcycle club, um, but just kind of tweaked it to, to things that were relevant or not relevant once you're not in club life, right? So we got rid of the politics and stuff like that, but we still keep a lot of the structure and bylaws and some of those structures are, you know, everyone has to work out three days a week, a week. Most of the guys train jujitsu or stick and knife fighting or, you know, some sort of mix, some sort of martial art and then riding, you know, so every, once a week, everyone has to get together to either ride or train together. A lot of times we're working out together. Uh, me and a couple of guys do jujitsu together. So the focus really shifted to just the brotherhood aspect, you know, being on our bikes and having fun. Um, and it got rid of all the politics and the drama that comes with it. Right. And live, train, ride is open. Uh, yeah. So, so anyone could, could like get the live, train, ride t-shirts and patches and stickers. And, you know, uh, what I would suggest for everyone that's into it is, you know, pick that stuff up and then, and then tag yourself on social media, living the lifestyle, you know, riding bikes and lifting weights and, and stuff like that. The core group of us wear the symbol that I have on my shirt. Um, and that's not open to anybody. That's just our core group. Um, and that's essentially, it's like the club part of lift train ride, but, um, we don't have a name. We're not even calling it a club. I just say it like for lack of a better term to explain it, but we're not claiming areas or we're not, you know, wearing other patches or anything that's going to define ourselves or look like traditional motorcycle club. Um, but we are, you know, we do kind of have a uniform and we ride together and work out together and spend a lot of time with each other. Right. How do you feel about little Dave with what happened with him? So, you know, me and little Dave, obviously were in the same chapter for a long time. So we were, we were pretty close. Um, but it was more at the time, just to be upfront, me and Dave are friends now at the time, it was more of just, you know, we were brothers in the club and we worked together, but we, you know, as far as like with leadership stuff, but we weren't like 
you know, I was excited to see him at runs and stuff, but I'd never been to his house or been in his car or, you know, really met his family. Um, and when all that stuff first came down, you know, I, I didn't want to just blind, be blindly loyal and, and just assume that, that it wasn't true. So, you know, and at the time I was still active in the club and he was out bad, so I wasn't allowed to talk to him. So I honored that. And, and I just kind of was waiting for things to come out, you know, um, mm-hmm. waiting for more proof for more evidence. And, 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 the, and honestly, the proof never came. And, and I did, you know, I did, I went on um, insane throttle and, and I didn't go on there to defend Dave. I went on there to defend the process of labeling someone a snitch or a rat. Um, I think it's getting all too common in the motorcycle club scene and without paperwork, I don't think anybody should be doing it. So, you know, I, I think the people that had their minds made up about Dave one way or another, it's not going to change, right? They wanted to believe it and they believed it. Um, me to, from everything I've seen, um, and, and, you know, between that whole trial that went on and everything, man, I, I don't see any proof of it. I'm not saying that the dude was a perfect leader or that, you know, that, that he pleased everyone or made every right move. Um, but I definitely don't think he was a rat or deserved what he had coming to him. And, and like I said, because I want, I like to lead by example, you know, I posted some pictures with them. I've been pretty open about our friendship because I want to show, you know, here, everyone always talks about loyalty and loyalty and honor. Um, and then people jump ship when things aren't convenient or, you know, people are, or, or it's a bad look or people are talking shit, but you know, I, I wanted to show what loyalty looks like. And so I've been, I've been ever since I could prove that Dave wasn't a rat, I've stayed tight with Dave. Um, and I, and I support Dave and I defend Dave, but not just because we're friends but because of the facts. Right. So when that all happens too, because I've seen, it just seems like a trend with not the Mongols or Vago, just all the clubs. They're pushing out all the old school guys They're And then they label them bad. And, and then they, you know, they'll say, Oh, he's a snitch or a rat. And it, it's just so common now. I think the clubs have just gone in such a weird direction now. It's not even like it was 15 years ago. It's a huge generational shift just from the, the yeah, from the time I was in. And I think the, the unfortunate part of the frustrating part is, you know, the term out bad used to be reserved for people that were legit snitches or, or you know, messed around with the brother's old lady or, or stole from somebody. But like the legit low lives of the club world. Right. That's what that whole term out bad was. And then, you know, different clubs, I'm, you know, I can't speak for other clubs, but for Mongols, you know, after Black Rain and a lot of dudes had dropped their patch and stuff, then they started saying, OK, if you left without the 10 years in, you're automatically out bad. Um, and it just kept watering down what out bad meant. Um, and then, you know, then there's guys like my guys that the, the guy was out bad because he was fighting a case against another club after, you know, that he was doing while he was a Mongol again, you know, against me. So I don't want to get into it, but you know what I'm saying? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to mince words on that one, but yeah, but you know, my point is, you know, he's out bad, but he never did anything negative against the club. And because I stayed loyal to him, I'm out bad. So the, the frustrating part is, is just that, you know, that they throw that label out there and it's a tarnishing label. And the frustrating part is, you know, guys like Dave or I, and even Doc before he turned out to, uh, you know, do all the super negative things he did, um, you know, had made some positive changes in the club, man. And and it's, you changed the status to out bad. And it's almost sad to see the work you put in pretty much erased. Right. And they use that to keep other members, current members from talking and figuring things out. It's a, it's a big tool. To, yeah, that, uh, that's a big part. That's a big part of it for sure. This is all pretty fresh for you, right? Because you've only walked away from the club, what, like a year ago, right? Yeah, it's been a year and a couple months. Is it almost relieving to be out? Honestly, it's been pretty nice, man. I hate to say that because I think it sounds almost disrespectful, and it's not. I love the time I spent with the Mongols. I wouldn't change it for a world, you know, for the world. Um, it was such a great experience, and, you know, some of my best friends and brothers came from that club and those relationships. Um, but after, you know, being as active as I was for as long as I was, it's been nice to just chill and do me and focus on, you know, stuff I want to do and, you know, not be gone every single weekend and traveling or taking on, you know, other people's stress and the stress of dealing with other clubs. And um, it's been nice, man. And, and on top of that, I've been able to do stuff I couldn't have done in the club, like my YouTube channel and I'm writing a book and, you know, there's different stuff I could do that, that I wouldn't have been allowed to do as an active member. So it's, it's been a blessing. Um, but you know what? It's also, I've been very, you know, very blessed with the fact that I had a tight group of guys that left with me. Um, you know, what I see in this world a lot is that people that leave or, or get pushed out, 
And then they feel like they have nobody because they went from having tons of friends and brothers and people always there to them. And then all of a sudden they don't. Um, and I didn't have to go through that. So between my jujitsu team and, you know, people I knew from the punk rock and skinhead world and then the guys that stuck with me, I, I still had so many friends in my life and brothers that that it wasn't a big didn't leave a big hole. Well, that's good. That's really good because uh, I've talked to quite a few uh, ex motorcycle club members and and for some of them, it's like one day this is your life and it all changes. You get politicked on or you do something stupid or whatever the reason. Now you are no longer a part of it and you just wake up the next day like, well, now what? All right. At least you had, you know, good friends that came along with you. And, and now you have you have sort of a program still. Yeah, it yeah, definitely fills right. that void. And then, you know, obviously working out and jujitsu and like all these other aspects of my life kind of have a, a focus as well. So I'm not just like sitting around wondering what things were like or missing things, you know, so I still have a direction. And I think that's helped a ton as well. Like I tell I tell a lot of people um, when I talk about the book I'm writing, because because I'll, I'll be the first to say that I've always said that, you know, I don't like when club guys write books like their tell alls and book stuff, because to me, I've always felt like that's profiting off of the patch. Um, you know, there's guys that will say, if the only thing in their title is the name of the club, such and such member, people are buying it because the name of the club, um, you know, but what I would say uh, on, and, and it's not just me, there's a lot of people like this, but the club was just part of my story. My, you know, being a, a member is just part of my story. There's so many other aspects, you know, like I said, growing up in the punk rock and skin and world's a big part of my book. And, you know, I became a social worker and a mental health therapist and I work with kids that are on parole, pr parole and probation. And so there's so many other pieces to my story that I'm not just selling, Hey, this is me because I was a Mongol. That's just a part of my story. Right. So how do you get into doing something like that? The, the mentoring, you know, yeah, I have, a master's, youth. I have a master's degree in social work. So um, when I was going in and out of jail for um, those probation violations, I was obviously pretty burnt out on jail. Right. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out like what I wanted to do with my life. And there was a member, there's a member of the Mongols, Richie Rich, who's got his PhD in clinical psychology and the dude's all blasted in tattoos. And, you know, he's a really well-known member. And I remember thinking, well, that's really cool, man. And if he can do that, you know, maybe, maybe I could do that. So I, I started with my two year certificate in drug and alcohol counseling um, really fell in love with psychology. So I spent four more years getting my bachelor's degree in psychology and then two more years of my master's doing social work. Um, so I went to school for eight years and, and that's the, I mean, that's how I make my money. That's my career now. What do you think would happen if a vast majority of the Outbad members from all the clubs decided to get together and start their own club? Man, I don't know. So that's a tough one, right? Because it, it, it depends, you know, are they out bad for legitimate reasons or because of politics or, I mean, there's, you know, I wouldn't want to be affiliated with people that, you know, that were out bad because they told on other people or stole from people. Um, but as far, yeah. yeah. But as far as like the, you know, people that are out during political stuff, I'm sure we all have a lot in common. Um, and, and even as an active member, that was something I used to say is, you know, when I was in the skinhead scene, I, I knew a lot of guys from like the Bay Area that were into the punk rock and hardcore scene that ended up joining the Angels because of where they were from. Right. And then, you know, guys on the East Coast that joined the Outlaws. That came, we all came from the same scene and they just joined whatever club was in their region. So, so many of us have so much in common, man. And, and the only thing different is what patch we picked up. And a lot of that was because of someone we knew in the club or what area we're in. Um, but it doesn't, you know the enemy thing, you know, goes deep once you're in the club and, and things happen, but just on surface level, we all have so much in common. Right. And that's another thing. Like you're, you're just, you have your natural uh, clubs that it's like Tom and Jerry. They're just on top of each other as soon as they, they see each other. Right. And that's a hard way to live too. Like you go to the grocery store and you're in the club and you see, you know, X clubs, club member in there wearing his cut and then all of a sudden you're fighting in the middle of a grocery store. Yeah. I mean, you've always got to be ready. And that's kind of what we talked about before about the law enforcement stuff too. You know, if you're going to join a major club, you need to know what area you're in, what other clubs are in that area, and then really need to know what comes with it because that's definitely part of the risk and the stress. Um, and you know, win or lose, it's still stress, right? So it's still something that weighs on you and tires you out. And, you know, um, like when I lived in San Diego, man, we couldn't go to a bar without, you know, four guys in a chase vehicle and back up and couldn't be at the bar for very long. Like it kind of took the fun out of going out. Right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, at the time I was a young kid and I know what I signed up for, but, but thinking back bigger picture, you know, people, I don't, I think a lot of people jump in without realizing this until they're doing it. And it, it's something that the general public doesn't quite acknowledge or recognize either, but just the stress level of how things can change any minute. 
um, man, it's pretty, it's pretty wearing. And, and, and over the years, it definitely can get old. Right. Did you have any uh, CIs that in, in your chapter? In Oregon, when we first started, there were two. Um, like I said, that was before I kind of knew what the CI thing was. Looking back, there were some pretty obvious red flags. But, you know, I just kept telling myself, well, I know these guys aren't feds. I know they're not actual cops. Like they were doing dope and, you know, doing dumb shit. But, you know, looking back, they were the ones instigating issues with the other clubs in our area. And they were the ones trying to instigate illegal activity. Um, and, and I think those red flags would be obvious now. But, you know, as a 25 year old kid that's brand new to the club life, it was hard for me to spot. Absolutely. I mean, that's the biggest worry uh, for me. If I was in a club, like there's so much going on. There's so much. The feds are just so deep in everything. And that, I think the frustrating part is, you know, on the surface level, when I first joined, I was like, I don't care because I, I know that I don't do illegal stuff. You know what I mean? Um, you could look in my free agency. I don't make any money. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a social worker. You know, I've always kind of lived paycheck to paycheck. But the caveat to that is, you know, you could get caught for defending yourself or your brothers in a bar. You could get busted or caught up just because you're in leadership. Um, and, and that's I think that's another part that I think gets overlooked is, you know, the sons of anarchy generation and all these guys want to be president, want to have the flash that says they're in leadership. But they don't really understand what comes with being in leadership. Um, and part of those things is you could get busted just for things that guys underneath you did because they might think it was done by at your direction. So there's just so much that goes into it that I don't think unless you've lived the life, people don't know. Pee Wee from the. Uh, the Hells Angels. He walks out. The Mongols are walking into the wedding chapel as they're leaving. It was yeah. his son's wedding. Yeah, another story. He looks at his guys and says, "Well, I guess we got to do what we got to do," and takes off on the Mongol. Uh, they called that coercion. Just him simply stating, "Well, we know what we got to do." Yeah, coercion. That's a four-year sentence just for saying that. Yeah. And the crazy part now is these informants could bring it up and you can just nod your head or something simple and you're getting busted too. You know, I mean, there was guys during black rain where an informant would call and ask him where to get dope. And I remember one of the guys said, Hey, I don't do that shit, but you might want to check with so-and-so. And, -so. and then he got facilitating a drug deal and he was on the phone. He got five years for it. So it's like here, things that you would think aren't illegal because it's not a big deal. We're getting people jammed up just because of the patch you wear. Are there any times that you saw in the Mongols where they, they obviously it was a political move and they just pushed somebody out that had been in for, for decades. Like I've heard about it in other clubs, but the Mongols, you're, you're the first Mongol or former Mongol that I've talked to. Right. That one's tough to say, man. I mean, there's, there's definitely people that have ended up, you know, when, when I first joined the club, the best advice I got was to stay out of the politics, stay out of politics because um, yeah, on paper, we can definitely say I've seen people pushed out because they disagreed with leadership. But those same people, a lot of times, once they disagreed with leadership, would break certain rules or talk behind brothers back or stir the pot and go about things the wrong way as well. Um, so then it depends, I guess, if we want to nitpick what they really got thrown out for. But but I mean, yeah, dissenting against leadership is always going to be a slippery slope. And, and a lot of times it's going to end up with getting kicked out for sure. Yeah. So you're writing a book. Yeah. Yeah. I'm writing, I'm writing a book. And like I said, you know, the, the Mongols is, is part of my story. Um, but you know, there's a lot of it just about me and my life. You know, I'm, I'm an identical twin brother. Um, you know, I, and I, like I said, I, I, I grew up in the punk rock and skinhead scene and then band and touring and then did the motorcycle stuff and then really got into jujitsu quite a, you know, pretty heavy. And then, you know, I'm a social worker. So it's just a general overview of my life so far and just kind of the ride I've been on. Nice. Do you ever worry uh, of repercussions of, of them trying to come for you basically you know when i when i left like i said at first i was in good standings and even when i was put out bad the message that went out was that you know there's no beef for ill will um you know i'm just they essentially said much has moved on with his life um it was actually really positive which is kind of conflicting to that bad statement that went with it right but um you know as far as i know there's there's no general beef um i know they're on a no contact so i would assume if i saw someone would just ignore each other um but as far as I know, there's no sort of beef or anything like that. You know, the, the the part, I guess, where it gets tricky is you spend as much time in the club as I do, and you've had different run-ins with different people in different clubs. Um, you know, who's to say that that's any different with a patch or no patch? And, and on my end, I'm living, let live. I don't have any issues, but I'll defend myself. But, that, but what I'm saying is I don't know who has beef with me from other clubs because of things I did when I was in the club. Um, mm -hmm. So that's never going to completely go away. Um, but, but, you know, as time goes and space and, and everything kind of happens, I think things start to fizzle out. Well, that's good. That's, 
like, cause that's a worrisome thing in life too. Like you're trying to move on with your life, do something else, you know, uh, getting degrees, writing books, doing YouTube, and you don't need the black cloud hanging over the top of your head every definitely, time you walk around. Definitely. And, and I think just with human nature and the way things go, you know, life's going so good that that's, <laughs> that's something I get worried about. Right. Is that some, something stupid from my past is going to come up and grab me when everything's, you know, when I'm moving forward, just to suck me back. And, and hopefully that's not the case. Um, but it's definitely a concern. Is there any kind of message that you would want for the youngsters when it comes to maybe wanting to, to prospect for a club? Yeah, man, I'm, I get messaged a lot on social media where people are pretty open and ask a lot of questions. And, and one of the ones I get the most is, you know, would you recommend I prospect or is joining a club for me? And only you can answer that. You know, my, my, my recommendation would be spend as much time with that club as you can, because honestly, what you see is what you get for the most part. Um, you know, people aren't acting entirely different behind closed doors as they are to your face. So, you know, if you're really starting to get to know these guys, spending time on the road with them, partying with them, going to bars, you'll get a good idea of how they treat each other, how they treat their prospects, kind of the lifestyle they live in. And, and if it if it jives with your lifestyle, you know, if it's something that you guys have connected and shared interest, um, then why not? Right. But also, like we were talking about before, you've got to know the risks and be willing to sign up for those risks. You know, there's a lot of people that reach out to me and say, hey, you know, I've got a wife and a kid and a good job. Should I join? Um, and, and, you know, again, I can't answer that. There's a lot of clubs out there, probably almost all of them, where people either are married or have kids and full-time jobs. So, um, you know, I, I've said this on a lot of my interviews, but I think the adage of joining the club is death or jail is kind of an old adage, right? You could definitely be a club member and live a successful and happy lifestyle. Now the risks are higher for things to happen, like we've talked about, but there's still a lot of positives to it. And I still think if it's a good fit, it could be a good fit. Um, like I said, I don't regret the time I spent in club world it made me who I am today. And, you know, I'm really happy with it and the great connections I made. So I would be, it'd be hard pressed for me to try and talk someone out of it. I would just say, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. That's a great answer right there, man. <laughs> so, uh, so when you were in the Vagos, went to the Mongols, did you have Vagos tattoos? Um, no, I had two, I had a little 22 on next to my eye and then a winged wheel on the other side. Well, I had an MF on the other side and I covered it with a winged wheel and I've had those lasered off since then. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's another thing. Everybody wants to know about the tattoos. It's like the biggest question I find in my comments when I do any kind of interview or whatever you want to call it with a former motorcycle club member. Well, what's kind of a trip is when I retired, I was allowed to keep, you know, I was in good standing. So I was allowed to keep my tattoos. Um, but I covered them up before my got switched to out bad. And I know that rubs some people the wrong way, but honestly, my stance on it was this. I don't want to represent myself as something I'm not. I don't want to live off of merits and laurels of other people. Um, and and even, even though it was a big part of my history and my past, the visible ones I wanted to cover up because that was no longer me. It was a part, it was a chapter in my life that I was closing. So I, I do know that, you know, some active members took it as disrespectful and I, and, I, and I hear them. I don't agree, but I hear it. I get it. Um, but, you know, coming from my perspective, like I said, that was more of me closing a chapter and moving on and, and not trying to represent something that I was no longer a part of. Right. Well, not just that. It's almost like, having a target you know i know that you had a tattoo on the back of your head yeah you know the biggest i mean the target thing yes but on top i mean not to sound like arrogant but i think most people in the area know who i am either way so i don't think the tattoo was all that important the biggest thing with covering up the one on my head was employment man you know i'm working with kids and youth and you know like i said i work with kids and on parole and probation so i deal with a lot of juvenile um juvenile probation department and stuff like that. And so, you know, I go to these trainings and, and meet with these people in the, in that, you know, on the law enforcement side, so to speak, you know, judges and stuff like that. And I've got Mongols with the middle finger blasted on the back of my head. Um, you know, I covered up the middle finger part several years ago, but I ended up, you know, I was the one, one of the big things of covering up the Mongol part. And even when I was active in the Mongol toward the end, I was wanting, I was considering covering it up because it was really inhibiting my career. Um, and, you know, obviously I, I knew that when I got it, but I was also a lot younger and in a way different place in my life when I got it too. So, so did you prospect for the Mongols? I didn't No, I, I was patched over from the Vagos. Wow. That's pretty big right there, right? Well, yes and no. I think I, like I said, doc was kind of on this big recruitment drive. So a lot of people came in without prospecting and even like I said, I can't speak for other clubs except for one I've seen, but I, I think it's, I don't want to say it's commonplace, but a lot of, exceptions are made for people these days, whether, you know, you're a charter member, you're helping start a new chapter or, Hey, you grew up with so-and-so or, you know what I'm saying? There's different reasons, but I've seen 
it's not all too too uncommon for people to not prospect and like in the mongols if you don't prospect you're a one-year probationary member and so you're, you're called a pea patch or a probate um you're a probationary so you know th there's different ways to come in and, and you're still you know putting in the work and helping out and helping with security and, and still kind of you know making a name for yourself um just without the prospect patch so what's it like walking into bars these days without the colors on man you know what so I, other than when I was like brand new and, and young, I don't think that's really ever defined me. You know, I, w one of the things I used to say in leadership is I, I, I didn't understand some of these other clubs in the area. So there's a lot of bars that say no patches allowed or no colors allowed. And then you find out why. And it's because a lot of these guys are going in there with their puffy chest saying, you know who I am? Don't touch my patch. And I've never wanted to be that guy that wasn't welcome back places. You know, one of the things I really liked is when I brought a chapter in somewhere and people go, shit, you know, the Mongols are here and they were scared. But when it was over, they'd say, man, those were the nicest guys ever. Don't mess with them. But they were great. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think honestly it's about the same just because of that's the way I've carried myself before. You know, um, I, I've never tried to, to, like I said, rest on the laurels or the merits of, of the patch or, or make the patch make me who I am. So honestly, without my patch, I think I'm the same guy as I was with it. Have you ever thought about reaching out to somebody like, say, George Christie to try and have him come onto your channel and you guys just talk? Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, yes and no. I think it would be, um, I mean, there's a lot for me to wrestle with on that one, right? Just because the amount of time I was in and, and you know, history between those two clubs. George is from, I, I respect what that guy's doing and I've seen a lot of his stuff we come from such a different generation. I don't know what we would have in common to talk about necessarily. Um, but that's a tough one, man. I can't say I'm opposed to it, but it, uh, we've, we've talked we, him and I have talked a little bit on social media, um, but we haven't like hung out or talked in person and stuff. And, and that's as far as it's gone so far. And it's been pretty simple as far as like advice about the book or, you know, different podcast stuff. So. I mean, absolutely. Now he's, he's opening up and doing his own podcast and all that. And obviously the book, everybody's enthralled with the lifestyle. So, you know, I mean, you have 15 years in one club, two in another. That's a, that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of uh, memories. For sure, man. I mean, you know, I'm coming on 42 years old. So the pretty much the, 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 my, mo the majority of my adult life, you know, I spent in motorcycle clubs. So it's definitely a huge part of my life. Nice. Like I said, with the Mongols, I didn't grow up really around many Mongols, right? Like they're like I said, they were in Henderson, but we never really saw them. I grew up when uh, the Hells Angels were the big thing in Las Vegas. You you see the things that are going on now, like with the the Vagos Hells Angels in Las Vegas on the freeway that that incident, All right? Or, you know, just these these wars that are almost out in the open, and I mean, you can call it what you call it, but I mean, you're doing it in front of a thousand people. How does that make you feel? Like, um, you know, that's a tough one because you know, if you're defending yourself, you're going to do what you got to do. As far as you know, instigating that thing, um, for lack of a better term, I think clubs are shooting themselves in the foot. You know, here we are. There's all these well-spoken dudes and NCOM and COC and an anti-profiling project and all this stuff to prove that motorcycle clubs are not gang members, and then they're getting in very public shootouts. Um, and so then it's very hard to argue that. So, you know, I understand that, that sometimes it escalates to that. And once it does, it just is what it is. But, um, I really wish it would stop happening as well. I mean, I, I think it gives the whole motorcycle community a bad name and clubs and everything in general, you know, so it's kind of a step backwards when, when the culture is, is moving forward so much, you know, sons of anarchy and all these different things that made this, our culture so mainstream, um, that stuff like that kind of gives it a black eye. And, I know probably the original one percenters and the, the, you know, the OG say, who cares? That was the point anyways, right? We don't care what anybody thinks, but the newer generation does. And, and, and we, you know, with the, an era of an age of social media and, you know, so many other things, obviously it's better to be, you know, at least perceived, um, or, or yeah, I guess it's just better in general, just to be a good person and, and to be perceived as good than to be out there and be the bad guy. Which, who had better parties, Vagos or Mongols? <laughs> Man, I was I wasn't in the Vagos long enough to really say um, I've been to maybe one really good Vago party, but I've been to a bunch of really good Mongo parties. Um, yeah. You know, the, the Mongols have some pretty some pretty rad parties, and and it got to a point where wherever you know each chapter was trying to top or each region was trying to top the other region, so <laughs> things got it pretty out of hand. So the Mongols definitely have some pretty pretty rad parties for sure. So, 
Were you in Oregon when all of the Antifa stuff was going on and they were doing? Man, I, and I wasn't. Um, and, and what's funny about that is back when, you know, when we were doing the anti-racist skinhead thing, Antifa was there, but we were too violent for them, right? Like they were so political and we weren't political enough. And to them, we were just as bad as because, you know, we were pretty indiscriminate. Um, you know, if someone had a certain symbol, we were going to beat them up. So, you know, to, to them, we were on the same page and, and we were kind of shunned by them as well because it was such a political movement. So it's it's kind of funny now I see some stuff in the comments sometimes or whatever when I say it was an anti-racist skinhead and people are like, oh, he's Antifa or this. And it's it's so far from the fact, you know. Um, right. But no, that, that's a little different generation than me as well. I was out of Portland by then. Because I had heard that there were some beefs, I think up in Washington mostly, between motorcycle clubs and Antifa. I had read something between, uh, I think it was Gypsy Jokers and Antifa, but I, I, all I know is what I saw on the internet, so I'm not sure. But I would imagine, right, like some of these really, really politicized far left wing, um, they'll trip on anything, right? And bikers are known for having, you know, imagery of swastikas and SS bolts. And um, and if you take it at face value, then that's going to start a conflict. And I, I've seen that stuff in Oregon for sure. You know, the, the helmet with the swastika on it and all of a sudden a bunch of Antifa people, you know, grouping up and chanting this or that or trying to blacklist barbershops and stuff like that because of it. So I've seen it happen. It's just it's a different era than what I'm used to for sure. It'd be crazy. It'd be crazy to see the clash between those two groups, uh, <laughs> right. you know, because Antifa, uh, I don't know. You look at it, it's like, oh, a bunch of probably, you know, just young kids that probably wouldn't stand up very well against the clubs. Right. And uh, all of us were watching. I was just like, yeah, let it happen. Let it right. happen. I think that was probably the, <laughs> I bet most people were on that page. Can you plug your channel and I will go find it real quick and I'll drop the link to it. Yeah. It's called Mondays with Mooch. Um, and essentially the, the point of my, I'm not doing stuff super often. So I'm just trying to kind of tell my story. And what I like to do is, um, you know, sometimes it's me riding, you know, share, sharing pictures and stuff from my past, but then I also like to try and get some guests on that were there for it too. So you're not just hearing my perspective on my story. You're hearing somebody else's. So like I did one with the singer of my band and we talked about touring and the band days. Um, and then I, I recently did one about, you know, how, how I was a Vago for a little bit. The next one I have coming out is within that first year of the Mongols. Cause like I said, that first year was pretty intense. Um, so it's just me sharing clips of my story when I can. So it's not, I'm not super active on it. I try and do one or two a month. Um, but then when I'm on other shows and stuff, I'd rather help promote the other show than my own. So then sometimes I go for a while without putting mine out too. So, but I definitely yeah. appreciate people checking it out, subscribing, you know, leaving comments. Um, and then my Instagram's OG underscore underscore mooch. And like we were saying before, I do my best to try and answer everybody on there, man. I mean, if you come and ask me some crazy shit, I'm probably not going to reply. But outside of that, man, if, if it's positive and, and, and people just want to shoot the shit or have questions about biker life, I'm more than happy to help out. So give me, Absolutely. A, follow, give me a follow on there as well and, and hit me up if you got any questions. You know, it's got to be hard. You, uh, you have all these stories. You have all these memories. But you can only talk about certain stuff. Man, that's been the hardest part about the book so far. Not even like legally speaking, but just like the over, like, you know, I'm, I'm working with, I have a ghost writer, you know, a professional writer that's doing it for me. And so here we are, we're telling stories or I'm writing stuff. And he's like, all right, that's a, that's enough, you know, or hey, that's too much. Or hey, we're going to lose the reader's interest if we just keep telling these stories. And and so finding the balance of like what's shareable and what isn't, um, it, it, that part's been a challenge or just, I guess, a new experience in general. Um, you know, I'm always that guy that's been pretty well known, like at the end of the parties, we're hanging out and I'm telling stories and, you know, funny anecdotes and whatnot. And so like figuring out what, what fits into the book and what doesn't, or what can share publicly and what can't. Right. Cause that's a big deal right there, especially yeah. with all the Rico and, and this is and that. I mean, at any time somebody could just slip up, say the wrong thing and, and it can cost a lot of people. Yeah, no, definitely, for sure. And that's what, I mean, if you read some of the other biker books and stuff, you know, people are pretty vague about certain stuff, or at least the smart ones are. Um, you know, Doc wasn't, and look how that worked out for him, so. That guy. He, uh, whatever happened with him? He's obviously in witness protection, yeah? I would assume. I honestly am not sure. I know he got out a few years ago, but. I mean, he's a, he's a big dude, right? Yeah. Like, can't really miss him, but. Yeah. I mean, that's so strange. And then with little Dave, it just seems like their biggest ob observation about the Mongols is, is the leadership, right? And I think the leadership stuff's been very public. I think that the majority of big clubs that are structured the same, you know, there's some that aren't, 
go through a lot of really similar things. And, and in fact, I know some of the other major clubs have gone through very similar things. What's different is the Mongol stuff is publicized for one reason or another, you know, doctor, a lot of attention on self and, you know, doing talk shows and books. And then, you know, David been on some, some media stuff. And then, you know, um, I don't think this was intentional on his end, but the whole beef with him got really publicized and then it became out in court. So it was in all sorts of mainstream media. And so I wouldn't say necessarily it's any different, like as far as like that type of drama and leadership issues, but I would say it's been more publicized for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it just, it's, it's like a black eye on the Mongols. Like that's what everybody who isn't a Mongol can look at the Mongols and say, Oh, well just look at their leadership for the last 40 years, you know, or 30 years or whatnot. But I mean, it's gotta be hard to be a Mongol and, and go through all of this and see all of this happening. And you have your friendships with, with certain people and then they're out, you know, and, and they're being called this or that. And you kept it with Dave, the friendship. Why hasn't he been on your, your YouTube yet? Um, man, like I said, a lot of my YouTube is going to be based off of my story and, and, you know, Dave's been all over the internet for a while. And, and I really think he's to the point right now where he's, you know, he's moving forward, he's staying healthy, and, and I want to keep rehashing old stuff. And I think it's yeah. almost better for like some time to pass so that when he does come back on, it's something new and positive instead of just continually, you know, beating that same dead horse. Yeah. So now after the club, are you doing any kind of jujitsu tournaments or anything? No, actually. So I moved out here to Illinois to join a tournament team in 2017. Um, but in 2018, I got diagnosed with a rare degenerative disease and I had to have my whole cervical spine fused. So I have C3 through T1 all fused, like big rods in my, in my whole neck. So I can't compete anymore. They, they said I shouldn't train anymore, but I still train. Um, you know, initially they said no more competing, no more riding. And I still do it all. I just just last year I rode from Illinois to Oregon and back. Um, I still train three or four days a week and then lift weights and stuff like that. But I can't compete anymore. I can't risk like getting thrown weird or someone pulling my head too hard or something and breaking the fusion. Right. I mean, have you been in any, everybody who's ridden a motorcycle for as long as you have, you ever had to lay that bike, the bike Man, down? <laughs> knock on wood, not for a long time. Um, but, you know, early on learning how to ride or riding on different type of pavement or gravel. And, you know, um, plus I think any one of us, that, you know, if you get in the bagger scene or bigger bikes, there's times where it's just a heavy bike and sometimes you're at the wrong angle and it, and it just, it falls over. Um, but thankfully, no, I've been, I've been pretty lucky that, that, you know, I've been pretty blessed with my riding stuff. I, I ride a lot and I, I've been pretty lucky that, you know, a lot of times it's not even the rider's fault. So like, that's why I say I've been pretty lucky. Do you go to any, any runs anymore? Like, yeah. So like lift train ride last year, linked up with a group called club style Illinois. And we put on an event at the Harley dealership. I still go to like local events and rides. Um, even as an active, like one percenter, I never really enjoyed like I, I like the side parties in Daytona, but I don't care for Daytona. I've never been to Sturgis because I don't like those big crowds and that type of scene. So I, honestly, I don't think it's changed much for me about what I go to and how active I am. I'm still pretty active. I ride a lot and, and try to support a lot of things. That's good. That's good. Well, all right, brother. I think I've taken enough of your time up here. Well, I appreciate you having me on. And, and for anyone that was watching and shout out questions, thank you guys very much. Absolutely, brother. Thank you so much for coming on. And, uh, and we'll be watching to see what you what you got going on. All right, man. Well, shoot me the link in, uh, when you're going to put this on, on YouTube again, and, and I'll help share it. This is who I was, but it's definitely not who I am. <laughs>